Okay, so yeah, so thank you all for being here. It's, it's really great to um, see everyone again and do something we really loved, and that's educating as a big part of what we do here at Tree of Life Nursery. So um, I, all of you, I'm sure, are here because you love California, you love you know, the outdoors and the wilderness, and a lot of that is bringing it home to your home natural garden. And so we have a lot of resource materials for you today. These, uh, will you raise that up real quick? So this is a, um, a handout we've put together. If anyone wants to grab them, Mike, if you want to hand them out, anyone. Uh, Mike has spent a lot of time and thought and really shared his experience over uh, you know, his lifetime working with native plants to have a really successful native garden. And so I know maybe a lot of you have, how many people have a native plant garden or want to start one? Excellent, excellent. So, so these are the tools and resources. We have handouts here for plants for butterflies, bees, uh, plants for slopes, how to plant a plant, and then this really informative uh, packet here. Typically, we'll, we'll, um, we sell these in the retail store, but they're free today with, with this workshop. And so um, there's everything from watering, installation, assessing your site, and all that, which Mike will go over with you all today. Um, so we are a resource here at the nursery for you. You know, we, not only do we grow the plants, but we want you to be successful. Um, I feel it's like an, I'm one of the growers, so I feel like it's, I shall have you guys almost sign an adoption fee and make sure you know what you're doing before. So these babies I've reared for a while are, are safe and secure in your home and a proper place. But, um, but no, but we're here to make sure you guys are all successful. So uh, coming up, our next workshop is going to be one that we've already filmed live. Um, but we use a lot of cool techniques to show you how to design a garden. So Randy, wave your hand back there. Randy is our, uh, our designer here in residence at Tree of Life. And so she does a lot and really incredibly talented on designing with this incredible biodiversity that we have of native plants in California and beyond into Baja, et cetera. So, um, so that'll be next Saturday. We're going to post that on our YouTube channel. So if you guys it kind of companions well with today's talk, with the actual logistics of growing a native plant and the inspiration behind that, but also how to get your own inspiration into the design of the garden that you have, telling the story of your garden at home. So it's a really great, I'm, I've, behind the scenes, I've seen it, it's really, really good. So I encourage you to check that out. After that, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna host, I think on the 23rd, so the following Saturday, uh, this, the California Native Plant Society. Uh, we are going to host them here at our local chapter, and a portion of the proceeds will go towards supporting that chapter. I encourage you guys all to join uh, the, the native local Orange County chapter or your own if you guys came up from San Diego or wherever. Um, there's a really great group of people, like-minded, that it all can help in that, that kind of community garden with natives as well. Um, they, any CNPS members here today? So you guys all always get 10% off plants here. And so if that's something that you guys are also wondering and wanting to join the Native Plant Society, it's a little incentive as well. So um, without further ado, uh, I give you Mike Evans, who will talk today on how to create and care for a native plant garden. Thank you. This is Kevin Allison, by, by the way, just so you know. Kevin has kept us viable through the 20 months that is working out all the details of Zoom and uh, YouTube and archiving workshops as well as promoting them live. And I'll just put in a plug for him as well. He has his own YouTube channel because he's turning into one of California's great explorers. He has a new sailboat and he's learned to sail in the last year or so and he's going solo to the Channel Islands and then paddling ashore and looking at the plants and the animals and the natural history of our Channel Islands. Most, most guys that have boats are interested in fishing and or impressing their girlfriends. And, and he, he may get into that someday, but right now he's married, he's fine, he can impress his wife. But right now he uh, is doing something very unique with his boat and that is to take these journeys to the Channel Islands anchor in some random cove, paddle on his kayak with his dog ashore and climb up and look around at stuff and then post it. So it's kind of like John Steinbeck, 100 years late, 80, 80 years late, 100 years later, he was doing that, in, well, 40s, 
He did Baja in the 40s, 80 years later. Uh, but not writing it, posting it on YouTube. Look for him on uh, YouTube. It's called SV Californica, which is the name of his boat. There you go. You got a plug out of the deal. But I'm really impressed with, we all are really impressed with what he's doing. And we're all going to learn quite a bit about Channel Island ecology and native plants from the Channel Islands as a result. Also, I want to thank you all very much for coming today. We're very honored that you would be here after 20 months of not doing this. Um, you're here. We're here. It feels good. We have a program ahead into the fall, winter, and spring for weekly workshops, 9.30. We'll have guest speakers. We'll have many different topics covered. I think we've got a native foods with Abe Sanchez already scheduled and a few other things going. We'll have the Seri Indians from Sonora, Mexico back in April. And, you know, we're just happy to have face-to-face uh, -face again. The venue that we used before was just a camp a little bit back behind me called Indian Camp. And the big tree that gave us the backdrop and was the most amazing landmark for miles around literally fell apart during COVID. The giant oak and the sycamores just, just on their own weight just fell apart. The place looks like a bomb hit it right in the center. We cleaned it up a little bit. And if you come back in 300 years or so, it'll be back to what it was before <laughs> it fell apart. I think we're going to clean it up a little bit more and use that camp again because it's a good spot. But for now, we're, at, we're going to call coffee camp. There's no coffee. So you go figure that out on your own. <laughs> um, let's get into the, the topic at hand, uh, create and care. You have this, this brochure, and while this is not per se a design class, I might ask Randy to come up in a minute so you can prepare your thoughts and give us a synopsis of what we can expect in your design workshop, which will hit the streets next Saturday on YouTube. But I would like to mention, because it says create, and, you, and it starts with site prep. So it's really the practicalities of uh, planting and maintaining and enjoying native plant garden or natural garden. We will mention design. When I say enjoying, if you want to just go to the last chapter and kind of cram for the test and hope for the best, that's what I used to do. <laughs> just like in a book report, just read the last three pages and <laughs> hope you could get it. <laughs> Didn't always work. But here I am. Anyway, the, if you want to fall asleep after this, the most important part is um, the rewards, the engaging in the landscape, the um, connection that you have with your garden when it's a natural garden is unique compared to any other garden. Um, maybe a vegetable garden would compare at some level. Uh, but most landscapes or what I also call decorated outdoor space does not engage or connect with people. It, you, for the most part, it does not, it's not evocative. You don't feel um, a connection in m many of the designed outdoor environments that we have around us today, especially in commercial and public sites. While they might be pleasant enough in that they're clean and green, they're not uh, they're not telling any stories. And so this part about connecting and engaging with the garden, these three kids right here are all grown and out of college and on their way into a life as naturalists. They're not my three kids. They are the three kids of our friend, Dr. Leon Baginski, a very fine MD who loves nature and hiking and is very knowledgeable about all things California. And he'll be part of this workshop series in the near future with his uh, passion for invertebrates and uh, especially butterflies and moths, giving us a talk on that, pollinators. So that's the, the reason why we're doing this and the how we're doing it is the rest of the book. And regarding design, I had a new thought, Randy, that we can maybe develop over the next few weeks. Uh, how many people have ever painted by the numbers? Literally as a kid, got the thing. Isn't it fun? Okay, so when you're done, you have a painting. <laughs> okay. All right. How many people appreciate and know the know the uh, California tradition called plein air painting, where an artist is outdoors painting a scene as it appears today, and putting all that soul and energy and creativity into that painting, 
tremendous amount of skill involved, but also there's a connection to the canvas because it's painting what you see right now. And that's why it's called plein air, out in, out, outdoors. Okay, many of the landscapes in the commercial and, and sort of uh, public places, tr housing tracks, planned slopes, homeowners association, parkways alongside the road, center median strips. If you look at them carefully, they're, they're more compared to paint by the numbers. They, they really have uh, a look to them that is um, uh, repeated over and over and very, for that reason, very predictable and, and, and a little bit tired if you're looking at it with a discerning eye. Again, pleasant enough and clean and green and acceptable, but, but no, there's no story being told. Whereas in a plain air painting, it, there's an amazing story and it never gets old. The same with your garden when it's a natural garden. I would compare it better to a story, literally, that you create, and then I'm talking now about a written story, a narrative. We've been saying this for a long time. The paint by the numbers is something that came up yesterday in my mind as I drove down and looked at a center median strip that looked like every other one I've seen for the last 40 years. Uh, the, the, the story, the narrative you write, you know, and it's about your garden. So if you're planning a brand new garden, or if you are adding to a garden that you already have, because we always do that, uh, a garden per se is really never finished. You're always engaging with it and connecting, and that means changing and adding and cleaning and trimming and, and enjoying the garden. Uh, that's your story. And, and just like a kid's story, it can start with once upon a time. There can be a little bit of a, of a fantasy in it, a little dream. So you write what you want, what you think your garden is, title it, make, give a, 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 your garden a title, the way in old England, the mail was delivered to a, you know, a place that had a name. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, and, and even New England in the early days of America. And then, and then once upon a time, my story, blah, 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 down to then, they all lived happily ever after, you know, because we do. It's a happy story. And in doing so, you have a narrative that you can follow. And everybody's narrative is going to be a little different, and it's going to have native plants in it, native natural feel. So you sit with writer's block and your blank piece of paper, and you don't know where to start. This is always the case. So write down a few key words of the things that you have or want or dream about for your garden. It could be table, two chairs, wine at sunset. It could be a hammock. It could be culinary herbs. It could be paths, a fountain, bird bath, you know, and you start putting these words on that you really want and connect them with sentences. Now you've got a story. And when you transfer that over to the design side, it's no different. You, you, you make those little symbols. I'm old school. I just get a big piece of paper and cut out little pieces of paper. You can do this on a computer, y'all. But, but <laughs> and then the little piece of paper says bench, or, you know, herb garden. And you can push these little pieces of paper around on your, on your plot plan, locating them where you want them. And then instead of connecting them with sentences, you connect them with paths. Okay, now you've got this kind of map. Now your big space turned into eight little spaces because the paths dissected. The, now those little spaces are easier to create a design for. And obviously there's spillover. You don't have eight separate designs. There's, but you get, you get my point. Now you've got, this, you've got control over this space. Even if it's a small space, you might only have one path and three, three puzzle pieces, not eight. Just the same, you have the beginnings of a story. And that's the whole difference between a natural garden and an ornamental garden that is more paint by the numbers. I've clicked a thousand pictures at Bouchard Gardens in, in Victoria, British Columbia. We've all taken pictures. I think the most photographed garden element in the world, and not, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, is the Mickey Mouse on the slope as you walk in the door, the gate. Okay, it's always done in flowers. It's always seasonal. 
at Christmas it's red because there's poinsettias or whatever. And Mickey Mouse right there is, is one of the most photographed garden scenes in the world. Okay, I'm not slamming that. That's, a, that's telling a story really out there, fantasy, fantasy story. But it's not natural. It's more like painting by the numbers. With your natural garden, the story goes on and on and on because every day is new. We haven't been out here for a little while, and I was just before you, some of you arrived, walking around looking at seedling caliandra over there, and I noticed a seedling grape right here that some bird planted, you know, and we can leave that here. And before we cleaned this up and got it ready, we took out some seedling poison oak. And, and there's, um, you know, little, this, this thing's still working. It's still alive and well. We planted this. Ribes viburnifolium, which is the classic shade plant for under oaks, and it's filled in and doing very well. There's snowberry over there. Here's a seedling oak that we have to grub out because, you know, it's nice there, but it's not, it's not telling part of the, the story we need. We got this oak telling the full story. That's a, thank you, Kevin, that's a Humboldt lily right there that we planted years and years ago, and it comes back every year and blooms with its bright orange lily flowers four or five feet high and then dies back to its center lily, uh, what is it called? It's not a bulb, is it? It's got, it's a, truly a bulb? It has these little fingers off to the side, kind of like garlic. Yes, it's, it's a, is it a corm? It's a lily. <laughs> okay, so Randy, do you have a minute to come up and just give us the highlight bullet points of what we can know from your teaching perspective on design? And then I'll get back into the uh, technique and horticulture of making these gardens work. Okay. Thanks, Mike. This is unexpected. <laughs> I am definitely not a public speaker, which is why I did everything on YouTube. But here I am sitting in front of people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll let everyone know. <laughs> I like the one on one interaction. That's where I thrive. <laughs> Okay, well, that was really important that Mike talked about this whole telling a story. Um, I feel like I didn't become, uh, I've always been an okay designer. I've been good at drawing, designing. I was a graphic designer before I became a landscape designer. But um, when I was presented with the task of, you know, designing a brand new garden, I just jumped right into the plants. That was always the first thing that I went to. I get here to the nursery. What plants should I put in? You know, and it was just like, overwhelming but you didn't know where to start and so I feel like that's where a lot of homeowners like struggle they try to learn all the plants they try to know which one's right they try to choose the right one and there's a lot to choose that's wrong and they're always like this is wrong this is not the right plant for the right place and I hear that a lot um, but I feel like I didn't become a great designer until I started to tell the story um, taking a step back and looking at um, kind of the world around us and like what makes us happy so one thing that makes me happy is like being out here in, in nature and going on hikes and um, looking at how plants grow naturally in the shade and, you know, looking at how rocks are for like the formation of rocks and how little plants will pop out of the side of them. And so that is my inspiration. Um, some people are inspired by like things like Disneyland, you know, the Mickey Mouse and like it's super graphic and they like more of like a simplistic look. And so as you get out and you see what makes you happy, um, I encourage you to bring those things home. And so taking photos um, when you're out, um, going out, you know, to your grandma's house, maybe that's reminiscent. You can always add a rose in, you know. I love native gardens, but, you know, things that tie you to your garden, that's the most important thing. So whatever is going to get you out, um, out of your house, into your garden, that's, that's what I would suggest doing. So, of course, I am strictly, you know, I... I use only native plants in my landscapes, but if a homeowner comes to me and says, you know, this plant speaks to me, this is really important to me, of course I'll use that because that's what's important. Um, also vegetables, you know, having a veggie garden is also really self-sufficient and um, they're great because they're complementary to native plants. So I guess, you know, not jumping into um, all the plants, which is kind of the fun part to me at this point. Um, but just getting into that story is what Mike said, um, will really bring your garden to the next level and it'll really be you. It'll be a depiction of you. Like we all dress a certain way. We all wear our hair a certain way, but 
um, our gardens can also be a self-expression or express ourselves in that way as well. So I guess that's, I'm going to get more into that next week. Uh, our YouTube channel will have all of that. And so, yeah, tune in. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And that's not that's that's to say that we're here to answer your plant questions, but at the same time, please continue to learn about plants because we all do that, and that's what's fascinating about this field is that it's continual learning your whole life. So, uh, but when you have a design in mind and you have this, this needs to be a tree, and here I'd like a plant that offers me some privacy, and over here some flowers and you have these concepts on your plan, that's enough to really do it because we can help you put in the detail of plant names and show you the options that you have, the components themselves to make that garden. So we're, we're here to help um, right here face to face when we're at Tree of Life Nursery. In addition to what we're talking about today, there are several resources always these are called books. They're kind of like the internet, except they have honest-to-goodness pages. And, and they have an index, which is a little bit like Google. And, and, uh, and th this is, <laughs> there's information in here. <laughs> These are really amazing things. If you haven't discovered them, I, I, I highly recommend them. And th this would be a flora, which lists all the plants in a given area. This is for California. This is really about botany. And this is super useful to understand what grows here naturally and is, can be, the information is not horticultural, it doesn't talk about garden use, but you can apply it in the gardens once you know where things grow. A little bit more on the user-friendly side would be a book like Bob Allen and Fred Roberts wrote about Orange County wildflowers. And this is technically more like a flora, but it's illustrated and with photos and there's a lot of great information. So this is local and uh, pertinent and can be a supplement to what you're doing for your garden. But many of the plants in these books will not be found in nurseries. You'll never be able to get them into a garden, but it's just great to understand the bigger picture of natural plants where they grow. Then when you get more into the horticultural side, something like this, California native plants for the garden, by our three friends, Carol Bornstein, David Frost, and Bart O'Brien. We just call this book The Three Amigos. And this is a really great book with many, many plants listed alphabetically, and then more plants that wouldn't fit into the editor's uh, limits, uh, listed more like um, in, in a briefer format. And uh, it's kind of like an encyclopedia of plants. Um, again, the majority of the, the best ornamental native plants, meaning good for the garden, are listed alphabetically. So this is for plant ID with some ideas on design and how to combine them with other plants. Excellent book. And then this one is, is a few years old now, but ideas are exactly what we're talking about. Glenn Cater and Alry Middlebrook designing California native gardens. This is about what we're talking about today. Choose a theme, write a story, plant a garden. The theme being, and I'm just going to page through this, it would say here's oh, community-based garden design. Okay, plant community. Bluffs and cliffs, redwood forest, coastal sage scrub, channel islands, desert, alpine meadow, montane meadow, mixed evergreen forest, oak woodland, grasslands, chaparral, riparian woodland, wetlands. So those are some pretty big picture habitat types and then how to design a garden that looks like one of those. So in your designing and, and, and uh, imagining your garden, you want to create a space that reminds you of your favorite places in California. And at the same time, the space is um, complementary to the rest of the area. Maybe your architecture has a lot to do with it, the, 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 the neighborhood in which you live, all the factors so that you can say, 
you know, I love the deserts, I'm going to create a desert garden, or I'm going to create a redwood forest, or I'm going to create a chaparral garden or coastal sage scrub, and that gives you some limits, you know, within which you can write your story and tell it really well. Um, and then there's an old, older book by Bob Perry, who was quite, is quite a uh, great um, advocate for a, a California, a honest to goodness, real place California. This book has lots of plants, not just natives, many non-native plants, but it became the go-to book for many landscape architects and horticulturists, landscape plants for California gardens, and there are a lot of native plants in here as well. So there are tons of resources, including the internet, and we really recommend that, that, that you're always looking into every bit of information you can find because it's exciting field. Okay, so back to this now. Let's go right through and not word for word, but site prep. Let's get right into the how you grow. You've got a design, you've got a dream, you're starting in with a theme, you're gonna tell a story, now you gotta make it work, and there is some horticulture involved. It's the same thing with that plein air painting. We have some artist friends. One, Mark Kirchhoff, comes here to teach classes. And while I've never attempted plein air, I don't, I don't even want to. It looks so hard. <laughs> I think I just better off not not. I just cut my losses and and move on to something else. But he wants to give me a palette and a and a palette knife and a brush and set me down in front of an easel and let's do it my way someday. Point being. I might have the dream, I might have the story, it's right there, that's what I'm gonna paint. Now there is some technique. How do you mix these colors? How do you apply them? How, what's, how, how do you make a drawing to start, you know, with your pencil or your charcoal on that canvas? So there are techniques involved to make this work. And, and this is called horticulture. So when it comes to site prep, you wanna start with moist soil. So we're in the perfect season now to plant native plants. We haven't had enough rain, we had about all told since July, almost an inch, six tenths just in the last week or so. That's not a bad start, we'll take it. But it doesn't get, if your soil has been abandoned or not watered all this time, that moisture didn't soak down, but about like this. So you have to pre-soak your ground and start with wet ground, moist ground. If there are weeds on your site, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, really? Well, it means that the soil is good enough to support weed growth. If they are perennial weeds like Bermuda grass, nut grass, that little yellow bells, whatever it's called, oxalis, those types of things, you could sell your property and move to another place that doesn't have it. <laughs> or, or you can deal, and, and that might mean the use of an herbicide, probably does if it's Bermuda or nut grass. And if you're really opposed to chemicals, you either move and buy a new place or grit your teeth one time and kill these, these, these uh, tenacious weeds with an herbicide. The yellow bells oxalis, which is quite seasonal, and if it's just in little patches, I can actually tolerate that myself as part of a storytelling. I mean, if you've inherited some old property that has this, um, it could be part of a meadow, and you can actually pound it back over the years by clipping the leaves and clipping the leaves and reducing the photosynthetic opportunities for the plant little by little it sort of redu reduces down to nothing. Not so with nutgrass and Bermuda however. But if there are other weeds, just annuals, this and that, and little grasses and some other mustard and things like that coming around, you can control them very easily without the use of chemicals and they can be a good sign knowing that you have good soil. Varmints, that's if you have deer, gopher, rabbit, squirrels, etc. You know, you're gonna have to figure out a way to deal with that. We're, we're planning and helping some people with a garden in a rural setting right now. And you know, their dream, their story is for this mini farm that has an orchard. And the reality is that a deer can hop a fence that high. So, you know, you got these, this dream for an apple orchard and you got deer on over there, you gotta figure that out. And so everybody has to deal with varmints, if you will, um, at that level. And if they're a minimal problem, then great. You know, like in the middle of town or something like that, you might get some gophers. Um, but, but this is something that you have to start with. And then regarding amendment, the, in many situations, the, the, the recommendation comes in to take the ground 
and till all the ground for the whole garden area and incorporate organics, you know, compost and mulch with a rototiller. As a general rule for native plants, that's not necessary. There's two reasons. One, it's expensive and it's bringing in a new material and it's a little bit exorbitant as far as the needs of the plants. This is typically what happens in the days when we were laying out rolls of sod to make a lawn. You had to have some nice bed underneath it. But when you do that, when you break up the soil and till, you have broken the hard crust of the soil and it feels in, like it's, it's better and it kind of is. But down below that, <laughs> there's still another layer of not broke up soil. You know, you've got this two layers of here's this fluffy stuff and here's the, the real world down here. So for most native plant gardens, amendment would happen if you're going to amend, meaning to sort of fluff up the soil and make things better for the new plant. That happens on an individual basis, plant by plant. So when there's a plant being planted, the backfill, which is the material that goes into the hole around the root ball, which is what comes out of the container. So you place the root ball in the hole. You've got this space around because the hole is slightly larger than the root ball. That material that's going back into the hole is called backfill. And it came out of the hole. <laughs> that's the dirt. But then when you blend that with a good compost and maybe a little organic fertilizer, you are truly providing a buffer for that plant between its root ball, which was growing in the container in the nursery, and the real world out here. Now, if you have fantastic soil, you don't need to amend the backfill, like this soil. This is, this is like an amendment. I mean, look at this centuries of oak leaf mold on top of alluvial silt. It's a dream. But most people don't have this. And even here, it plants, plants like a little tender loving care. Many people think that native plants are so tough, you know, and you can just abuse them. In fact, don't they, don't they appreciate abuse? And, <laughs> and toss them out in some dry slope and leave them there. And they're native, fend for yourself. That's so far from true. What, they're plants from a nursery. They, they're going to require nurture in order to get established. Then they really are tough and they can hold their own, uh, you know, in the garden. So this amending is, we recommend it, though others would say not to. Our basic take home is, if you've been planting plants for many, many years or your whole life and you've never used amendment and, you're, and they all do well, keep doing what you're doing, you know? <laughs> Don't change your ways if you've had success in one way or the other. But if you, ha if you ask me the question, I would say take one-third compost to two-thirds dirt, blend it on the outside of the hole. That's what goes back in as backfill, and that provides this buffer for the root zone where the container plant roots explore that buffer zone and say, huh, that's pretty familiar. Feels a lot like the nursery root ball. Hey, but there's something new in here called soil. And then when they go just outside that zone into the soil, they say, hmm, yeah, I, I've tasted that before. It's, <laughs> that's, that's soil. It's not bad. I can use it. And off they go. And you've got a new plant. So fertilizer, same idea, balanced organic fertilizer, pre-blended into the backfill will really be nice. These little tablets that landscapers throw in the hole, I don't consider that really a very good practice. Sure, it's fertilizer and sure it's in the hole, but it's all concentrated in one spot. What's the point? And, and doesn't the, aren't the roots all around? Was it that hard to just sort of blend a good organic fertilizer in? And then mycorrhizae, that's a big word that is spelled to the tune of the Mickey Mouse Club theme song. If you ever want to know how to do that, it's M-Y-C-O-R-R-H-I-Z-A-E. I spared you the melody. And I <laughs> see. O R R H I Z A E. Just remember two R's, a random H, and you're in there. <clears throat> That's a beneficial fungus that is in most soils, and we do have it in our root balls at Tree of Life because we cultivate it into the, the potting soil. And what you're talking about here is just um, a, a system by which the plant has um, help. This fungus is a, has formed a symbiotic relationship with the plant and attaching itself to the root and invading the root slightly, it sends out hyphae, which are the fungal threads, and they act like roots. 
So the plant and the fungus get along just great because the fungus says, hey, I'll bring some nutrients to you. And the plant says, cool, I'll give you a place to live. That's the symbiosis and it goes on from there. So you wanna um, try to not interrupt that or certainly to bring it in if you don't have it. And then irrigation, you want to pre-irrigate and get your ground wet and test your irrigation. So if we were giving this talk in August, I would be saying now is when you're cleaning the ground, you're forming, you're forming these mounds and changing the grade and making little streams and rivulets and bringing in rocks and testing your irrigation. In fact, while you test your irrigation, you can sprout some weeds and then you can go pull them and hoe them out. And you can just get this whole thing ready, August, September, then October you plant. So the pre-work can be done over a period of three months or three days, depending on your season. And since we're in the planting season, you can accelerate the soil and site prep and get right to planting as soon as possible. So that's right now, fall is the time. And here's the technique on how to handle a plant. We talked a little bit about it already, but it's digging an oversized hole. And if you don't like digging holes, come, at, come approach the, the problem with a positive attitude. And that is this, there's a hole right there, okay? I just have to get the soil out of the way to find it. So it's just a lot easier than digging a hole. <laughs> And yeah, it works. So it worked for me for a long time. And, I've, and when I'm doing group, like group plantings, I tell the kids that. There's already a hole there, just find it. Um, so you dig the hole slightly deeper and slightly larger than the, than the container root ball. Many people would say, no, I don't dig it deeper because I, when you dig it deeper, you have to put some backfill in the bottom set the root ball atop that, and then you run the risk of this material under the root ball settling, and the root ball settling, and being too deep in the hole. So if you don't plan for that, that, is, that can be a problem. And to avert that problem, if you really just wanna, just, just set that root ball right on top of firm soil, so, meaning that you would only dig the hole much wider than the root ball, but not much deeper. Either way works, but if you dig it deeper and you want some fluff under the root ball, be sure to compact that the best you can. And then when you set the plant on that, set it just a little bit higher than what you really want because it will settle a bit. And so having done that, dug the hole and pre-moistened everything, you set the plant in atop either the firm floor or the little mounded backfill. And then while you're back filling the rest, the hose is, in, is running at a trickle and you're moistening everything so that it's going in wet. Most landscapers don't do this. And as a result, many of the plants either don't take at all or they take months and months to finally get a hold and grow. But if you do this, it takes a little longer, but, but when you walk away from the plant, it's well watered and you won't have to come back and address the water needs of this plant for in the dry season a week and if it's now you're just watching the rains and maybe you're coming back in a couple weeks and soaking again or a few days depending on the weather point being this you water while you're planting you can have a soft rain nozzle on the end of your hose and you can create a little rhythm where you're plant if you've got several plants you're putting in you've got holes out there and you've got the hose here and you're moving around and when you're finished you have a you have a plant that is in a basin because you've created a berm around the outside of the hole the berm is outside the dimensions of the hole and so it's concentrating rainwater and irrigation water in to the planting hole so the root ball is this big the planting hole is this big the basin is out here okay and it's just a little suggestion of a of a berm okay and then if you really are out on a remote site and you need to capture every drop of water that there is you can create another little moat out here. We call it a buffalo berm. And then out there, another berm. So you've got this little ring. It looks like a target. They're kind of crazy. Uh, they, they, they melt away over time. The, the rain just, they're gone. But, but they're very effective in getting the water to go down into the soil where the roots will find those, that moist soil. So now you, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so this is so that, so there's a YouTube on how to plant a plant. There are the the uh, handouts that we have, other information on our website saying exactly all this. But the reason I'm going into it right now is so important because this is not the practice in the in the nursery and landscape trades. I learned it from a guy who grew up on old ranches here in Capistrano, and this is how they planted citrus on remote sites. This is when you just didn't have a water on the hose like this. It was water in a tank behind a trailer that was, you know, to get those plants established. It was a big deal, and you didn't want to come back and have to do it right away. So they planted with water and moved on and came back and watered as needed. And I learned it from an orchardman and years and years ago, and it's the only way to plant for us here at Tree of Life with water running in the hole. When you're finished, you have this plant which is in the center of the basin, but picture your sink. Your drain is in the center, but it's the low spot. That's not the case here. The stem of the plant is coming out of the center of the basin, but it's at a little, it's a little bit higher than the rest of the basin. That's the crown. So you have, you don't have the water draining into the stem, what's the collar of the plant. You have the water soaking around and the collar Yes, when the basin's full of water, there might be water touching the stem for sure. But as the water settles in, the stem is high and dry. So there's this little mound in the center of the basin, then there's the berm, and then if you're really gonna knock yourself out, there's another little berm out there. And that's the proper way to leave a plant that you've just planted with a basin. Now, after you've planted with water flowing into the hole, now you take your soft rain nozzle and you water all around and you fill the basin and you wet the berm, kind of cementing it up, and you walk away. And you can ask yourself, you know, do, do, are there any air bubbles? No. Are there any dry spots? No. You know, it is a thoroughly watered and properly planted plant. Okay, that's the technique. Um, there's a thing here about sowing some wildflower seeds. This is the time of year for this. Get on it. I just wrote, and it just came out onto the email and on our website, October in the Natural Garden. Please subscribe to these if you don't already. They come out once a month in your e inbox, or all of them are archived, or you can find it on our website as well. Yeah, you can sign your email right up over here and, and get each month, the month in the Natural Garden. And the format is the same every month on what to do. Different t garden tasks, pruning, mulching, fertilizing, and sometimes it just says, not now. <laughs> but October was so much fun to write because everything, every category said, yeah, do this. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. You know, it was, this is the month you can do no harm unless you just go out and hack plants with a, with a power tool and, and, uh, or indiscriminately you know, break some horticultural rule. But, but really, this is the, the plants want our interaction. They want to be touched. I say that in this month's article. The, there's, there's, a, there's a connection to gardens, and gardens want our presence and our involvement. I know this because I've seen a garden go into mourning when the caretaker, the owner, if you will, the caregiver, passed away. I've seen this happen. Gardens and people connect both ways. So October is the time, man, to make love to your garden. And you can do all this stuff and, and enjoy doing it. So uh, watering, let's get really quick into watering. Uh, during the establishment period is what this talk is about, care and create. Picture that you have two root zones, three in a way. <laughs> let's go with three. The day after you planted the plant, you've got the root ball, which is the nursery sized container. That's where all the roots are. That's a root zone. You've got the next root zone is this fluffed up area inside the planting hole. It's virtual, it's, 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 it's potential, I should say. And it's gonna be full of roots pretty soon, within days or weeks. Then you've got this big thing called the soil where there are no roots, but that's where they have to go in order for this plant to be healthy. This is why I'm always baffled when I go on to construction, landscape construction jobs, and there's a mature tree being planted, a 24-inch box tree, 
you know, which is a nice thing. Here's a pine tree or something that's, some, that's on the plant, and here it gets installed, and it's got a berm and everything. And there's two little sprinkler heads this far away from the trunk of the tree. Okay, that's an incredible expense, and, and it's, that's really only good for about six months to water that root zone inside that berm, literally watering the nursery root ball. Why? Those, root, those bubblers or those sprinkler heads should be out six feet away from the tree, eight feet away from the tree, and in there. Or, let's just go back to real gardening, some guy with a hose can take care of this in the, in the planting hole, and then the sprinkler system, if there is one, can water the potential root zone of the real soil outside the planting hole. So, what I'm getting at is when you've just planted a plant, you've got three things in mind. The nursery root ball cannot dry out. You have to keep that moist because it just came from a nursery. The area just outside the nursery root ball, inside the planting hole, has to stay moist in order for roots to find their way in there. Roots don't just take a guess and say, hey, I think I'll, I'll explore some dry soil, because on the other side there might be some moisture. That's, there are a couple of plants that do that. They're really weird. Okay, they're called phreatophytes. They are like mesquite in the desert. Mesquite in the desert have roots 40 feet, 50 feet deep, and they find water 50 feet down, but between that water and the surface, there ain't no water. Now, what coaxes them to do that is that they went to school for mesquites because they, they, have, they have their own rules. But other plants don't do that. <laughs> Only phreatophytes, these really strange creek, creek bed desert plants that explore through dry soil to find perennial moisture at incredibly deep uh, levels. Okay, aside from them, plants don't just chance the idea that there might be some water out there. They follow moisture. So your root ball has to stay moist, the planting hole has to stay moist, and then out there in the soil. And presumably, unless you're in a sand dune or something, the soil out there is going to dry out slower than the soil in here, meaning that you're going to water in here more frequently than out there. And you can neglect none of them. So on a brand new planting, the best way to get it established is by hand, is to water the, the root ball for the first three months or four months as needed so that it stays moist and the roots can start to go out. This area out here might be on a sprinkler system, or you might be setting a sprinkler on the end of a hose, or you might have hand watering it, but whatever, you're, you're keeping it moist down to a level of 12 to 14 inches, but it will dry out slower in more, most cases than this. So you have the responsibility to concentrate your efforts on the newly planted plant and not neglect the surrounding soil. Does that make sense? As the plant becomes established, it no longer is necessary to water inside that basin. When all the plants in the garden are established, you have roots everywhere and you're watering the soil uniformly, creating moisture everywhere. Then you plant a brand new plant in a five-year-old garden. Guess what? You're back in the business of watering a root ball. So I can't overemphasize the, the importance of hand watering. I've stopped guys with white trucks or bright colored vests, orange cones in the street. You seen them? They're everywhere. Sometimes they have a trailer behind the truck. That's really fancy. It's, it's the phenomena of landscape maintenance in Southern California. I call it white, white truck, orange cone, bright vest. And, and um, I've asked, do you have a hose? They don't. Often they do not carry a, a garden hose. They're so dependent on automatic sprinklers. They got every power tool in the world for trimming plants, but they don't have a garden hose. This is unexcusable. <laughs> Thank you. You need to just hand water. What it does is it slows you down, gives the plant the best and most appropriate way to water, and you're, connect, you're kind of seeing, oh, look, over there, I got a, a new gopher, or, hmm, some aphids, or, wow, I didn't see that. Grasshopper came, must have come through and ate that leaf. You're kind of seeing what's going on in your garden by just the simple act of hand watering, especially a brand new garden. So please have these on hand and use them not only in the brand new garden, but for sure in the brand new garden. That's watering the plant in. And then when it comes to watering in the long run, over the long haul, please go to our website and look up, or onto the monthly newsletters, and w look up what we've um, coined, because I don't know any other way to, to, to call it, 
the occasional, <laughs> it's too cumbersome, the occasional deep soak and frequent refreshing sprinkle method. Occasional deep soak and frequent refreshing sprinkle method. Here it is. Pretend it's not going to rain next month, okay, because we're in October and we hope it does. But if it's July, let's call it May, June, July, you're coming into the dry season, you want your garden to stay viable and disease-free and, and, and strong, the, the way it's done is by the occasional deep soak, meaning that you're putting about an inch of water on about every three or four weeks, maybe even longer intervals, depending on where you're located. If you're near the coast, obviously, it doesn't dry out as fast. If you're further inland, it might be every three weeks that you are applying about an inch of water. An inch of water might take, with some conventional sprinkler systems, um, three hours to put on, okay? You can't run your sprinklers three hours and be effective. In most cases, it, it will run off, it, the sun will come out, the wind will come up, it won't be, it won't be efficient. So you do it in two or three days. So three, let's call it three consecutive days, early in the morning, you run the sprinklers for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So here's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You've applied an inch or an inch and a half, which is the ideal amount. That's a nice rain, by the way, and it usually comes over a three-day period when we get it. You've applied a nice amount of water to your garden, the inch and a half of rainfall soaks down a good 8, 12, 14 inches, stays down here. And so over a three-day period, you've provided this beautiful rain event. And then you stop. You lay back. You don't have to do that again for that three or four weeks. But in between, because plants absorb water through their leaves, and because they like your presence in the garden, and because you like to be in the garden, you go out in the late afternoons, don't forget the occasional deep soak is in the morning. You go out in the late afternoons at when the sun is low but not down, so that for the most part the leaves will be somewhat dry by nightfall. So you're talking 7 o'clock during the summer, 7.30, after dinner, cup of coffee, glass of wine, whatever. And you do this refreshing sprinkle, which has the pistol nozzle or whatever, thumb over the end, I don't care, but you're just getting everything wet. Leaves, soil surface, it takes five minutes, maybe 10, okay? But you're not watering. This is not going to give the roots water because it's not enough. But it cools everything down because it's been a hot day. We're talking August here. It gets all the plants ready for night. They're like, yes. <laughs> Here's what happens if you don't do that. They get ready for tomorrow morning, but they're ready by about three in the morning. They're, they're hot. It's dry. They've been closing up their stomata. They've been, they've been holding on to moisture. They've been enduring the whole day. Night comes. They start to take a deep breath, and they kind of feel like going to sleep a little bit, and they're tossing and turning, thinking about how hot it was. And then by about 2 a.m., they're they're relaxed and they're happy. If you're a real scientist, ignore this. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, three o'clock, they're sound asleep and they're happy. And then six o'clock, the sun comes up and it's like, oh no, not again. Okay. And that's their life through the summer. And natives can handle that. That's what, that's what, that's what they do. But if, when you go out and do this little monsoon refreshing sprinkle in the late afternoon, oh man, they just go, yes. And they, they, they just, they're happy as soon as the sun goes down. They have this really long night. They're soaking in that moisture that you just gave them in the leaf. They're, they're opening up their stomata so that they can breathe better. And they're ready for, and tomorrow morning comes and they're like, yeah, no problem. So you can do a refreshing sprinkle. I wouldn't recommend it every day per se, but like two or three times a week, almost whenever you feel like it, because it can do no harm. You're just, you're just coaxing the plants into happiness by simply watering them down. And it's a great time for you because that hummingbird is going to come over and take a bath while you're doing this and you're going to see other songbirds. And I highly recommend this, and I'm not kidding. You turn the hose straight up overhead because it's hot. You've been enduring as well all day. And just shoot up the water fully clothed and let it all come down on you and take this outdoor shower. And you will honestly feel what the plants are feeling 
and it will be a cool thing. Okay, so so you this is this is how you water occasional deep soak, re, um, frequent refre refreshing sprinkles, and and notice that it's all done um, without a time clock. If you can set a time clock to do this, tell me how you did it. Mulching. When, there's a whole YouTube video on mulching as well. The bottom line on mulching is that when you have mulch, like this tree has made for itself over the eons, that has uniform particle composition. In this case, I would call these flakes, the leaves, and some sticks, the twigs, which, when they break down, turn into chunks, which we'd, we'd find a little deeper. Okay, but the flakes and the sticks combined are great. When you find an, an inferior mulch, one that will lock in on itself, and it took me 10 years of, of stewing to figure out how to explain this, and I think I've got it, but I hope I'm not wrong. But when I see mulches that lock in on themselves and turn into mats, that, that however thick they might be, that water will not penetrate. You've seen this in gardens. And air won't go through back and forth. And they're really not healthy for plants at all, root systems. This is what they're made of. Um, flakes, sticks, strings, and dust. So when all of those are present, and you know the flakes are the little pieces of sawdust, the sticks are the little the strings are the hairy things, the fiber that came off whatever bark was ground up, and the dust, there's always too much of that. And when you have all four of those in the mulch, it locks on itself and turns into an impenetrable mat in no time and does more harm than good. So avoid mulches or organic top dressing that has all of those. If you find one that is just flakes, that's great. Under a pine tree, walk into a pine forest, and you'll have just strings, and it'll work just perfect. And if you're going to apply your own mulch, I, I recommend a little half-inch walk-on bark, like a redwood bark or some sort of wood product, so that you're applying just chunks. <laughs> and if it's a new garden, the chunks should be small. And if it's an older garden, the chunks can be bigger. Okay, this is pretty basic. But the real deal, and I'm not saying you have to mulch everything, the real deal is to encourage your plants to do this, not rake it away or blow it away. Encourage this, and now you have the plants making their own top dress. I prefer to call it top dress than mulch, because mulch often implies turning it into the soil rather than just sitting on the surface. And don't forget, for the California native garden, the natural garden, especially in Southern California, which is our dry region, the idea of a top dress made of minerals. Yes, decomposed granite, aggregates, chunky little, you know, when you walk and hike and look, you'll not see very many places, spongy outdoor spaces, only in woodlands and under the trees and deep under the, the shrub layer. But most of it, the exposed areas are lovely aggregates, decomposed granite, plain dirt, little rocks. So don't forget that you can have, you can have that as a top dress and make a very, very effective look, especially when your theme has been coastal sage scrub, chaparral, desert, anything that has Southern California look to it, a uh, three inch layer of redwood gorilla hair doesn't look right. It just doesn't look right with manzanita, so you know the chemise and sugar bush, and these, just, there's just something wrong about the, the initial look. Whereas a chunky mulch, only about an inch thick, and then swaths or areas or sprays of, of combining the mineral, or I, it's called non-organic, but it makes it sound like it's some problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's not organic because it's mineral. <clears throat> so I like to call it mineral mulch. And you can actually design the understory, the layer of the ground under your planting with patterns natural, of top dress, varying top dresses, different sizes of aggregate, different kinds of organic mulch, or none, to complement the planting and to reflect the shadows. And to, it's just another layer of design. 
just don't necessarily bring in anything. And if you do, don't bring anything bad for the plants. And then if you bring in something, consider it part of your whole overall design, that it can be um, uniquely beautiful as part of the story that you're telling with the top dress. With the ultimate goal being the plants themselves, Ceanothus, Toyon, all the shrubs that we can talk about, they lose their interior leaves all the time. They're called evergreen plants, but they continually drop leaves. This is an evergreen oak. See here? They're continually dropping leaves and making new ones. And that is the goal, is to have that as your top dress. Fertilizer we talked a little bit about. Don't be afraid to use them. Use organic fertilizers at the right time of year, which is spring and fall, and, and your garden will be happy. Um, as far as pruning and troubleshooting, you have um, very little to do. I'll just talk about pruning, thinning, heading back. You can follow our, our monthly newsletter to get more detail. But basically, what, what you do want to do is have on hand, when you're doing any trimming, a little coffee can with a solution of, of bleach, 10% bleach. They have one part bleach, nine parts water. Stir it up a little bit. Doesn't have to be exact. Just eyeball it. And, and you can dip your shears in the solution of bleach periodically to keep them clean so that you're not spreading any plant disease. That's just throughout the, the day or the, the, tier, the period that you're pruning. If you're pruning diseased wood, it's obviously a branch dieback on manzanita or something like that. You cut into healthy wood, you remove the unsightly dead branch, and you dip your shears before you make any more cuts. So you're dipping every cut when you're cutting questionable or diseased wood, and then periodically. And then at the end of all that, you can, you should, will rinse it very thoroughly so that they don't rust and get all funky while they're in storage. If you don't like bleach, you can use Lysol spray or you can use alcohol. And about eight seconds in the bleach is enough to disinfect. I think, I think the technical term I was taught is disinfest. I don't think, of, I don't think a, our scientist Kevin is nodding to the affirmative. You can't disinfect something that can't be infected because this is not alive. It cannot be infected. It can only be infested with a disease organism. Slight detail. Is that right? Or decontaminated. Or decontaminated. Thank you. <laughs> or sanitized. Yes. But um, there's no infection. Now your plant can have an infection. Another story. Okay, so that's pruning, troubleshooting. We're here to help. We've got an uh, a email called gardenhelp at treeoflifenursery.com. Please just send photos, send um, questions, and, and I, I answer right, uh, promptly and try to get right back on what, what could be the problem. Watering, if you've got these ducks showing up in your garden, that's cool, but it means you're watering too much. and um, you want to you want to lay back a little bit, <laughs> but we've already talked about the 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 meth the occasional deep soak with frequent refreshing sprinkles. We got to figure out a better term for that, but that works. And then mulching we've talked about. We're we're just moving on down the line. Fertilizer pruning, troubleshooting, and on like that. Special situations: extreme sun, deep shade, slopes. Be creative. When you're planting in a hot period or during the hot weather or in a hot sunny spot and it's a brand new plant, you don't have to set it there and, and ask that it fend for itself, you know, or else. Like some sort of, you know, sit in the corner, you know, and be good. You, you can plant the plant and then shade it with a temporary structure of some sort, an old fruit case. Uh, I've taken palm leaves from somebody's palm tree, you know, fan palm. Take a leaf or two leaves. The petiole, that's the stem of the leaf, is a handy little stake. And you can plant these palm leaves, make a little half tent around a new plant and, and shelter it from the sunny side of, the, of the, the afternoon sun for three weeks, four weeks. Take off one leaf, you know, accl acclimate the plant to the to the site. So treat each plant with care and in these extreme situations like really hot sun or, or, or wet areas or cold areas or steep slopes, be creative on how you can get the plant established. This is the whole point. And there, we're, I'm trying to figure a new way for saying that too because I don't think everybody quite grasps the idea of establishing a plant. It's a horticultural term, but it's like the, the tender young years. Okay, it's the it's the toddler through 
20? Mm, <laughs> I don't know. How old? <laughs> when do they stop being tender and young? <laughs> but it's, those, it's the years when a kid needs more attention, right? Before they go out on their own. And 35? <laughs> 17. <laughs> 17 more like six you know what i'm saying when they, when they're when they can make their own breakfast um it, it, that's true in the garden and especially true with with natives it, it, they're no different than any other plant uh the idea that they're low maintenance that's the biggest problem word that we have yes they don't require any maintenance they require care and that care is more intentional and more meaningful than mowing and blowing and 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 pruning it's it's a, it's a it's a reciprocal relationship type care it's maybe less frequent than obviously a disneyland flower bed but it is when you're there it's it's quality time so during the establishment period these toddler years the the plant and the, in the case of plants it's months um you need to uh give them more care than than later which you'll love so much you'll be so happy being a parent of a toddler that you'll never stop planting new plants the, you'll have this established garden and you'll say you know i miss that little making breakfast for for my little two-year-old and so you'll buy a new plant and start all over and that's the fun of it all so that's where we get to the enjoyment and the and the engagement part that we um we have uh we started with the the idea with the, of the california native or the natural garden being you know kind of the highest in my opinion level of of horticulture is not brand new or it's not unique to just me. If you look at the Japanese garden, and this is the final little closeout, um, it's, it's a true work of art. And, and it's fame, the Japanese garden and the Japanese gardening public over the centuries have been become famous for this theme. And here's what happened, really tricky everybody. They're in Japan, they use Japanese plants to mimic nature on a small scale. They are, by definition, native plant gardens, and they are, by definition, natural. Now, the hyper-pruning and the hyper-miniaturization all became part of that cultural interaction with the plants, but the whole point is, you take big nature, you fit it into a small garden, you walk around in it, on paths, over little bridges, upstairs, back down, meandering, the whole, out, the whole design of a Japanese garden is centered on paths, and the paths are unique. They have different surfaces, they have different stepping stones, they become, they transition from one to another in theme. They go over, you stop on right here, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's your reflection in the pond. That was, that was designed, that was intentional. Walk over here, here's a bench, you sit down, you look, oh look, there's a waterfall. That's all very, very deliberate. And these gardens had their purpose. It was to get people into them. They literally had a big gate. The gate was not just to close at night. The gate was to, it was a statement. It said, this is a new place. You're walking out of this busy city life, your busy life at all, city or non, and you're walking into this garden. And it is an experience. And as you walk around, you kind of end up at the Zen garden. <laughs> I sell plants for a living. This is gravel and sand raked around boulders, <laughs> okay? I'm not going to make any money on Zen gardens. But the point was that you got there and you've already been tranquilized by nature. And you get here and it's just like the, 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 the experience is indescribable. And then you walk back out and you're talk, talking with your friend or whatnot. And, and I've been to these in Japan and in other parts of our country, in Portland, there's a good one. Huntington Gardens has a nice one. Um, Balboa Park, these places. You find yourself whispering to your friend as you're walking through, the, through these gardens. You find yourself changed, transformed. So that's what we're talking about, 
when we're talking about digging a hole, how wide to dig it, how high to build, make the plant. Those are the technicalities, but don't take your eye off the prize. The goal is this experience, and it can't be had in any other garden, native plant gardens only, Japanese garden being the prime example. Are we gonna do the exact same thing with the stone lanterns and the bridges and the, yeah, the equivalent, the equivalents, boulders, structures, but California style and miniaturized nature. Okay, thanks a lot for coming today. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, that was good. Really Thank you, good. sir. Thank you very much. Really, really good, <laughs> See, he likes that too. <laughs> yeah, do we have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> okay, very good point. How do you know from in our catalog there are watering guides based on once, twice, four times, or all the time watering? Catalog's quite, I, the first catalog we ever did, I literally made those little circles with a ballpoint pen and a T-square, you know, to line them up straight, and then a black BIC medium point. <laughs> <laughs> one dot at a time, the hundreds of dots that are on that first catalog. That was an attempt by us to talk about watering needs. The information is still valid. The question is, how do I know how to transition to that? In general, those plants that have like all four mm, categories filled in with a little dot, water once a week or twice a week or three times, four times a, a month, once a month, twice a month, four times a month, or keep it moist, naturalized. Those are wetland type plants. As a general rule, those were plants that need and depreciate wet soils all the time. Like, um, uh, well, typha would be there, but I, yeah. Um, even, even like, um, I'm trying to say that, what's that, what's that mint that you can drink the tea of? Uh, stackies, stackies. Yeah, we gotta use more stackies, by the way, on our jobs. Um, it's a mint, uh, nettle mint. So that's the, the it, it's generally referring to plants that like moist soil. Yeah, some of the monkey flowers, yeah. Any other questions? That's a really good question. The definition of establishment on a plant, what is it based on? It's the, the, the region where it comes from? Yes and no. Yes, that's, that's going to give you your key on, on how to get it established. Established would be that that plant now only requires either zero irrigation. That means it's completely on its own. Some people have that as their goal in their garden. In most cases, they have to be ready to tolerate kind of a period, July, August, September, when they look a little stressed, maybe a little more stressed than your neighbors want to tolerate, but they're alive. Okay, that would be really established and naturalized and you're not, you're just waiting for rain. Okay, that's an interesting goal and I don't have a problem with that, but for more, most gardens in a more horticultural sense, established would mean that they're literally thriving on those five irrigations a year. That, that, that deep soak that happens May, June, July, August, September, about once a month, and, um, and that's all. That, that in the winter, there's no deep soaks necessary because rains are taking, the, taking care of it. If you have a garden that is accustomed to moisture, you live in a dry area, the soil dries out quickly, we have a long dry spell in the rainy season, six, eight weeks with no rain, hey, you can give it a deep soak. There's nothing wrong with that. But as a general rule, we're coming up on our last deep soak of the year. <laughs> we're really hoping that rains take over until May, June of next year. So that's established when you're, when you're not having to do, let's call it that, when you're not having to hand water the root balls. Yeah, that's, that's the step. I don't know why it took me so long to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and they make their own cereal. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. 
when they're making their own breakfast. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay, what is considered coastal? That's a great question. Coastal is where there's coastal influence, and that would include by night. So in the bigger picture, we're coastal here because we have this river bed that's about nine miles in length and it has this big S turn. And at night we get coastal moisture. Whereas if you go just a few more miles inland or certainly into Riverside County, it party's over. There's no coastal, I'm talking summer. Summer, obviously if you can smell the sea, that's coastal. If you've got fog and, and humidity by day, that's coastal, but it's still coastal if you're getting marine influence at night in the summer. That would be a, a, a pretty good horticultural and even ecological definition. Because I have here the same plants that grow on the immediate coast. We also have here a few little intruders from the chaparral that find this little transition zone, I'm talking tree of life nursery spot, a good place to grow as well. But if you go further inland, you're going to lose the coastal influence and you're going to lose the presence of those coastal plants. Do you, do you, do you think that works? I was just thinking of Encelia Californica. So Mr. Island Man over here is talking about coastal sunflower, which is a very good indicator of a coastal environment. It does not occur here naturally, but it, it, grow, it would naturalize here if you planted it. Okay. That's a great question though. Yeah, because we, we think a lot about gardening on the coast as being um, sort of the, the, well, Sunset Magazine, Sunset Gar Western Garden Book used to have, the, maybe they still do have those garden zones. I think it was 24, they don't? No, they don't. They gave up on that? Oh, they oh. kind of do, but it's very bad. Oh, the magazine. Yeah. yeah. But I think the book still has oh, the gar yeah, those, the their own garden zones. Lane Publishing came up with these garden zones. Yeah which were very good for, for California. Then as they got bigger, they expanded it into Washington, Oregon, and the whole Pacific coast. And, and they're very, they were very handy. And coastal was like 23 and 24, something like that. Yeah. I use hay bales around. I got kind of big property, 26, you know, avocado trees. So I've got paths everywhere. I use hay bales to throw it down to keep the weeds from coming up. Mm -hmm. Are there any things in, in hay? Hay or straw? Which straw? Uh, straw. Okay, so uh, no. it, it's going to bind up nutrients first. In other words, for it to break down, it would it would take priority on the nutrients, especially nitrogen. If you incorporated straw into your ground, yeah, so you're, like you're 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 not helping your plants because the straw, in order to break down, requires nitrogen, and it would take priority over the roots of the plants. It would call it's robbing the nitrogen. If you put straw on the surface, that's less of a problem. While technically it is stealing some nitrogen, it's easy to add nitrogen, put some organic fertilizer out for two reasons. Help the straw break down and, and not steal nitrogen from your soil. So just supplement food on top of the straw top dress and, you'll, and your plants won't suffer. And that would be a decent top dress because it's all Sticks and strings. Hay would be like alfalfa, and that would be even, that would be about the same. It, it might be better because it's yeah. made out of a legume that has nitrogen in it, and could you could argue that it would not be as bad as straw. But either one, any organic on the surface yeah. is going to require nitrogen to break down but that's all part of the nitrogen cycle, which you can Google and figure out how that's working. When you incorporate it in the soil, raw like this, it steals nitrogen from the plant. That's why you incorporate in the soil composted organic material that's already broke down, and it is providing nitrogen to the plant. There's only so much nitrogen in the world. <laughs> it goes round and round. <laughs> Almost good. Huh? The nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle. <laughs> That's your homework. You're going to Google that. <laughs> I use books. Pardon? 
Oh yes, compost oh, yeah. and soil is good for for Everything. most plants. Again, now some plants, specifically some desert plants that grow in pure sand and they're not used to the organic material, they're not going to benefit from rich organics, not so much because of the nutrients, but because of the moisture retention. They won't want that. So, but the, again, there's always extremes on the edges of all, all these issues. As a general rule, compost in the soil is, of course, great because it is providing everything, air, you know, oxygen, roots need oxygen, it's providing microbiota, fun, fungus and bacteria, tiny little insects and other invertebrates, um, beneficials you, you can't even imagine. Plus, so it's got physical and physiologic benefit and then biologic benefit and, and then the nutrients, the chemical. Superfood. Yeah, it's everything. It's like, it's, you know, the, Google the soil food web. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these these topics have been addressed, but they're excellent questions. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, and they're sort of too much, too much. Yeah. So they're probably like a lepo pine or something like that. I'm going to guess. Where do you live? Yeah. So they're probably some old, non-native ornamental pine, and uh, enough is enough. You're going to have to take some of those off and discard them or do something else with it. And then under there, the the problem with under pines is twofold. One, one those leaves, and two the surface roots make gardening under pines and the shade, dense shade. So those three things kind of make gardening under pines a little bit difficult. But there are, I've noticed that Ceanothus Yankee Point, certain manzanitas that grow in the Monterey pine forest, naturally, uh, Arctostaphylus hookeri, Arctostaphylus, any of the ground cover manzanitas, Howard McMinn, others of the North Country um, origin, and then other, other uh, plants that grow native in drier conditions, even this ribes, but surprisingly, Ceanothus Yankee Point and other ground cover Ceanothus uh, actually do better in that kind of shade here in Southern California than they do in full sun. And the by creating those planting holes and watering them individually and doing a little thinning if possible on the pine and obviously cleaning up periodically some of the excess pine needles, you can garden pretty well underneath there. So, yeah, you can't just leave them all fall for years and years and years. Nature's solution to that was an, an, an occasional fire. <laughs> <laughs> the and, well, nature itself, I mean, yeah. pine forests, pine forests are, you know, this is a flammable plant that does not sprout from the base when it dies. And it's not a crown sprouter. So the only thing to rejuvenate a coniferous forest fire. is fire. It doesn't mean every 20 years, it means every 200. We're getting them by far too frequent and by far too hot and by far too big. It's another whole topic. But in the ecology of conifers, fire is included. So you could light the whole place on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll start crowding, right? <laughs> then you'll have lots of new seedlings. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Similar problem, eucalyptus, falling leaves, that is a, 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 a more unique problem. The, 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 the oils and the and terpenes and the other uh, chemicals in eucalyptus often make it very difficult for other plants to grow under them. That's why in many even natural eucalyptus groves in Australia or anytime you see the old groves here like Lake Forest was one or down in Scripps down near Del Mar, Nipoma Mesa, um, Los Osos, and in San, you know, San Luis Obispo County, these, these, these historic eucalyptus groves, you find almost nothing growing underneath them, exotic or native. And, and that's because the eucalyptus has a quality called allelopathy. It just, it just wants everything, it's selfish. Just wants everything for itself, won't let other plants grow underneath it. So, all I can say on that is clean up as, 
as often as possible, uh, leaving very little of that mulch, and experiment. Again, shade plants, or I should say native plants, which are typically thought of as sun plants, shrubs, like ceanothus and some manzanita, I would experiment with under, under eucalyptus. And, and when you get them established with that soft rain nozzle in the planting basin, I think you're going to have, will be sub surprised at what kind of success you can have. I, 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 think, I think that it, it's a matter of managing that excess leaf mulch, getting some of it out of the way from time to time. Okay, sorry if we went too long. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. We go on and on.